A few years ago, while attending an infamous technology conference, someone wanted to interview me about gender and the tech industry. Infamous because the men's bathroom line looked like this. Happy, I'm always happy, trust me. <laughs> also infamous because only five women has ever graced that keynote stage prior to 2015. There were literally hundreds of men per one of me at that conference. I was unflustered, though. You see, 15 years of being at the forefront of advanced media technology has trained me to be super comfortable in what some would call a male-dominated world. I told a reporter that day that work should be work and gender should not be a part of that equation. If my work is good, then it speaks for itself. Next question. The next question was, have you noticed any gender-based behavior in your organization? <clears throat> she didn't publish my post. <laughs> I wasn't able to answer that question, you see, um, because to be honest, even though, you know, like, I, I was really flustered. Um, and, it, and it plagued me for quite a long time, actually. Because, um, you see, I observe people's behaviors for a living, especially when it comes to how they interact with digital products. I've also led multiple cross-disciplinary teams of all sizes. And yet, like, I just totally blanked out. I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have anything to say. And uh, later on, I thought, you know what? I couldn't answer this question, it was because I never looked. So I began to look. There's no shortage of commentary on gender biases these days. As a matter of fact, Dave Ray sent me an article back in February, and the headline was that Portland is supposedly the worst place in America for women in technology. Not the second worst, the worst. Now, I'm not really sure if that's, you know, how, how, how you know, how, how you guys take it, um, because I'm from New York. But what I can tell you is that almost all of the observation that I read about unfold before me. The more I look, the more I see, the more I see, the more I want to fix. And while I'm super excited to see more investment in science and engineering education for girls, we all know that this is not just a pipeline issue. I don't want to relegate this to be a solution that someone else somewhere solves sometime in the future. I want to be a part of that solution today. So I asked myself, if I'm already able to, design, to use design principles to shape how people interact with my digital products, can I also use them to shape how people interact with each other? In this journey, I've come to realize that the scope turns out to be much larger than gender. It's actually about seeing that all of us are different. We behave differently, not because of our gender alone, it's also because of our race, ethnicity, upbringing, physique, culture, the whole, the whole nine. Equality isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. To get there, we need to design small little changes that enable us to work better together, not despite our differences, but acknowledging them in some ways. I'm gonna walk you through three examples of design principles. What they are, how they're using in, des in designing digital products, and how I'm using them to design habits for me and the people around me. In design, Affordance gives us a clue on how to perceive something, like a doorknob affords twisting or a chair affords sitting. It's not quite like a functional descriptor of something. It's not like an apple affords eating. That's, that's not right. Um, affordance is more of a primitive, subconscious reaction to an object. Here's a quick exercise on how to think about this. Which of these two headlines commands more importance. What about these two objects? Which of these two people? 
The average height of a CEO of Fortune 100 companies is six foot two. I'm 5'3 without these crazy heels. <laughs> I notice this because I get interrupted a lot in meetings. You see, being overlooked or getting interrupted happen because little short people carry certain affordances. From prehistoric times, big people are perceived to be stronger, more commanding, leader of the tribe, etc. I'm obviously not going to grow anymore, so what do I do? So one day, I started standing in the meetings that I lead. Immediately, less interruption. I was like, yeah. I kept at this for a little while just to be sure it wasn't a fluke. Um, and actually, it did work. And then I advised my team to do the same thing. Not long after that, I get this message. 30% less interruption. Remember that affordance is a subconscious reaction. We oftentimes don't register affordance biases until we're actually at the receiving end of it. If you're the taller one in the room, chances are you might not even notice how you're behaving. By noticing my own affordances, I can take positive actions toward ad addressing my own shortcomings. More importantly, by paying attention to other people's affordances, I can become aware of the biases that I place on them, perhaps unknowingly. And that gives me a chance to say, hey, how can I act differently to be a little bit more inclusive? A narrative context is the overall message you want to convey to users in your design. A good design has two elements. It should ad address very clearly what it is and how you should feel about it. Here's a simple example of how Google does it. You're here to search. That's what the search box is for. The Google Doodle animation at the top gives that sense of playful feel to what otherwise would just be straight up functional. The two elements combined together becomes Google's narrative context. When we communicate with one another, narrative context also comes into play. Put simply, what do you want and how do I come across? How many of you write like this? I came across this example from an article posted by Ellen Petri Lenz last year. Totally blew my mind. I ran a quick search in my own inbox. Last year, of all of the emails that I sent out, 25% of them contained the words just. You can try it at home to see how you fare up. Stuff like this is actually deep-rooted in some of our upbringing. At some time, somewhere along our past, we were taught that being direct is not nice, or that perhaps, even worse, we don't deserve to decide. And by we, I don't mean women. I mean all of us who see ourselves in this kind of writing. Yet, strangely, we look for leaders that make clear decisions in our workplace. If we keep writing like this, will we ever become that leader? Now I take a moment in every email to be intentional about it, and not just what I say, but also how I come across. This is much harder than standing in meetings. I just found out recently that this problem is so prolific that apparently you can download a Google Chrome plugin to help you <laughs> from yourself just in the event that you have written emails that undermine your own messages. So if you, you know, I'm not sure if it works or not, but it's really funny. My point is that all of us are in control of our own narrative context. All it takes is being aware and intentional about it in our communication. Number three. Imagine this with me. You post a photo on Instagram. You get little hearts from people. Your dopamine kicks in. You post more photos on Instagram. And before long, you're on it all day. You are among 400 million people who do this. This is called an engagement loop. It starts with an engagement action, in this case, posting a photo. 
The hard is a design element that triggers an empathic response. The response is immediate, which then reinforces the behavior into a loop. This is one of the most powerful concepts in fostering someone's engagement in a product. So, how can we apply this loop to shape how we interact? Let's take performance review as an example. How many of you have to fill in a performance review for your job at the end of the year? Can I see a quick raise of hands? OK, good, me too. There's enough of you who do this. OK, so you know how this feels. Doing reviews at the end of the year is a little bit like posting a photo on Instagram today, and then like nothing happens until like a year later you get like one heart. <laughs> You know, when the reward isn't immediate, the reinforcement of the behavior is just completely lost. To encourage better performance using engagement loop, we need to look at two things. What kind of behavior we want to see people engage in, and how we make sure that those, the reward for that behavior is immediate. These are the performance review questions that I get every single year, same one across all companies. All these questions boil down to is how have you achieved? A measurement that directly reflects self-driven ambition. Is this the only quality that measures performance? If all of us are measured against this one quality, why should we be surprised that the most self-focused person rises to the top? and anyone contributing in any other ways would just fall by the wayside. To be inclusive, we need to expand what we measure a whole lot more. My personal favorite is collaboration because it's easy to explain to you guys. I start by defining collaboration as the engagement action in this loop. Then I need to reward this action right away when it happens. One of the ways I do this is I create a hashtag high five in my team chat channels so that people can acknowledge each other when collaboration happens. And they can do this right away, and the reward is given peer to peer. And all I have to do is tally them up at the end. Now you might be thinking, hashtag high five, really? This seems so trivial, it's such a big problem. But you know, if you've ever find yourself like opening a door for someone and then they turn around and they look at you and they say thank you thoughtfully, you already know that small, tiny little gestures go, go, go a long way in feeling appreciated. What's important here is the idea that we can foster a lot of different kinds of behaviors using this loop. Here are a few more qualities that I actively foster. I look closely at how each of these resonate with my team, and then I structure the reward accordingly. Perhaps you'll walk away from this talk thinking that maybe you should stand more in meetings or use hashtag high five a little bit more liberally. <laughs> what I hope, though, is that you'll also take away why these design principles matter and how you might apply them in your life a little bit differently than me. So yeah, I'm a woman, a minority, a foreigner. I'm really short, and my age is ambiguous. <laughs> also, I work in technology. So I have a lot of cards stacked up against me, and I cannot change any of them. The biases that are baked into us are not going to go away overnight. We are already spending so much time and effort and money designing these digital products that change people's behavior by the millions every day. I'm optimistic that we can apply the same rigor towards designing our behaviors that nurture our differences. We have the tools, we have the willpower, we just need to do them small, tidy little step at a time. And I'm excited to see what you'll do. Thank you.